and welcome to this recording presented by the Australian National University College of Law. The following conversation, taking Indigenous experience into account in sentencing, was held on September 28, 2022, as part of the Visiting Judges Program coordinated by Associate Professor Heather Roberts. During his two-week residency at the college, the Honourable Tom Gray Casey, a retired Justice of the Supreme Court of South Australia, participated in a series of events in which he reflected on significant cases he was involved with, climate litigation, career advice for law students, and much more. This conversation was between Mr Gray and Associate Professor Anthony Hopkins, an ANU College of Law scholar and Special Magistrate at the Australian Capital Territory's Gullumbani Circle Sentencing Court. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are advised the following conversation may contain references to people who have died. Okay, well look, thanks so much for joining us and and thanks so much Heather. Um, Uh, Heather does a power of work here with the uh, Visiting Judges program and that brings a kind of perspective uh, that you just can't get um, without that level of engagement with the profession. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today um, with um, uh, retired Justice Tom Gray KC. Uh, I feel like having had to drill down into the case of SCOBY and, and think about the intersections with the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, that, uh, well, I feel, I won't say intimidated, but I feel that there's, there's, we, we're in the presence of someone who's done some inspirational things, has taken their responsibility within the criminal justice system, which is so often a grinding criminal justice system, to exercise power with a view to how that is going to impact the people within the room, but particularly First Nations and Indigenous people within that setting. And, and he'll I will say as little as I can and try not to get too excited by the process while uh, um, Judge speaks about the case of SCOBY, the intersections with the Royal Commission. But look, I do want to also acknowledge that we meet today on Ngunnawal and Ambri land. Um, we're meeting at a time where uh, there have been 517 deaths in custody since, uh, and perhaps that number itself is dated since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. Um, We're meeting at a time where incarceration rates nationally are 30% 30 of those in adult uh, um, uh, incarceration are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, And uh, the figure was 14% at the time of the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. So there's a lot pushing in the wrong direction and a lot of need for people, um, uh, uh, particularly non-Indigenous people, to shoulder Put their, put their shoulder to the wheel, if you like, and really think about both individual and systemic ways that they might engage. And so I will, after we hear about it, probably direct it in terms of individual and systemic and invite you to think perhaps and engage about the questions you might have, including what role might you have or what might insight you might have and thinking about your own future, if this is an area of interest for you. Um, I also want to acknowledge that you're hearing from two white guys Okay, this is two white guys talking about, you know, First Nations justice issue. Um, now, I, I don't, I think that, that's, that's the reality of this conversation, but there's a lot to be said for saying when we're talking about, for example, solutions and what to do, it's, it's not ultimately for two white guys or non-Indigenous people generally uh, to, uh, to come up with those, but to think about how they might ally themselves. Um, and that, those are complicated conversations, but it's also the case that when either of us occupies a position um, of power, there are responsibilities that come with that. And this is a focus on how does Indigenous experience, how can it be, how has it been taken into account and what might the various roles be? So um, with with that said, uh, I might hand over to Judge uh, and um, and hope that, uh, and and know that Judge will take us on an explanation of SCOBY and the intersections with the Royal Commission. Johnny Scobie was a Pitjantjara man, aged somewhere between 35 and 55, and he had a long association with the criminal justice system. He'd been a petrol sniffer at some stage and had some mild, mild cognitive impairment to the frontal lobe, and his behaviour deteriorated when he consumed alcohol. He committed quite a serious uh, paedophilic offence in about 19, um, in the 80s and spent something like 10 years in custody. When he was released, um, 
it was against the background of no treatment at all whilst in custody. Nothing had been done. He hadn't been assessed. He'd been dealt with quite poorly by the justice system. So unsurprisingly, on his release, he got into trouble. And he committed um, some minor um, paedophilic offending. He was breaching terms of uh, his release by being within close proximity to schools, watching children. Nothing very serious. Um, but it was enough for the court to make, in respect of some of this offending, a pedophile restraining order. So conditions of that meant he couldn't go within a certain distance of schools, meant to abstain from alcohol and so on. And of course, again, with no treatment at all and no real support, unsurprisingly, he breached that restraining order and re breached it repeatedly. Never any serious offending, but the community saw a threat there. Uh, teachers at schools would tell him to go away, but he wouldn't. He'd come back and be watching children. Then the Crown made an application that he be detained indefinitely because he couldn't control his sexual instincts. Section of the Act in South Australia allowed that jurisdiction to be invoked. To succeed, they needed two psychiatric opinions to say that he was unable to control his sexual instincts. One psychiatrist said that was the position. The other psychiatrist, a very experienced uh, forensic criminal psychiatrist who actually worked in the jails, said, oh, just a moment, this man's never had any treatment. It's very difficult to say that he can't control himself till he's been properly assessed. And so he wouldn't give the second opinion that the Crown needed. So their application had to be dismissed. But in the meantime, Johnny Scobie had to be sentenced in regard to a number of offences, about eight or ten minor offences. At that point, I had the ability to send the matter back to the Magistrates' Court or I could keep it in my jurisdiction in the Supreme Court. Unusual to keep it in the Supreme Court. But I felt that Johnny Scobie had had a pretty raw deal over the previous couple of decades, had never been really supported by way of assessment or rehabilitation. So I kept the case in my list and counsel supported that. Thereafter uh, followed two years before I could sentence Johnny Scobie. At the start, the Crown wanted him detained indefinitely, never released. After two years, the Crown accepted that he should be released into his community at Fregon in the Pichinjara lands. So what happened in that two years to bring about that change? I'd known Elliot Johnson QC, who was the principal Royal Commissioner into the Deaths in Custody Royal Commission. I knew I'd acted as his junior in court, I'd known the profession, I'd become a friend. So I was well aware of that Royal Commission and his work, and because he'd been involved, in particular with I think Pat Dodson in writing up the final report, I thought it should have a lot of close attention. And I was aware that it hadn't. I was aware that every government in Australia had accepted, I think, virtually all the 339 recommendations as policy. Very few have been implemented into law. So the first problem with Johnny Scobie was to get him assessed. And that was difficult. Uh, Dr O'Brien took a keen interest, arranged for a new, new neuropsychologist to be involved. And finally, it became clear that um, if he could control his alcohol intake, his uh, aberrant sexual instincts would be controlled. He'd, been, he'd spent the first 10 months of that two years period in jail, great difficulties. 
they want to have him in solitary confinement. And I say, well, the Royal Commission recommendation is not to do that. Um, battled with them. <clears throat> he spent time at Port Augusta, time in Adelaide, and then finally I had him released on bail to reside in Port Augusta. At that time, his community in the, in the Pitjantjara lands wouldn't have him back, didn't want him back. So it was a question of really encouraging the government to find the funds to have him assessed, to offer him the rehabilitation programs that he needed all of which were recommended in the Royal Commission. It was recommended he, uh, that a person like Johnny Scobie have bail. It was recommended that he be supported in the place of residence. It was recommended that he have proper health assessment and treatment. To get the government to pay for that took a, a lot of time and effort. Uh, I can recall that the, I was told by the Crown Prosecutor, no, that can't be done, Judge. There's no money. And I said, well, very well. well I want I want to have an argument about this question, this particular recommendation. I want to have the people of the department down to me why it can't be done, and we'll have an investigation about it. I'm not satisfied. And then he'd come back and say, well, they've, they've found some money, Judge, they can now <laughs> do it. And that happened on a number of occasions. So the matter progressed, um, and in accordance with the Royal Commission recommendations, I said I wanted to sentence Johnny Scobie on the lands. And by this time, the Crown had come to agree that a non-custodial sentence was appropriate. So we could go to the lands. We didn't need security. It was fairly straightforward. So I then discussed with the elders at Fregon, where he came from, the way they would like the court to conduct the matter. And a little to my surprise, they said they wanted the Supreme Court to attend, wearing full robes, wigs the lot. So I went with my associates and with counsel. Uh, we assembled in the Fregon Community Hall. Now, I imagine that's a room almost the size of this, except it was oval shaped and it was painted bright yellow. So it was a slightly surreal experience to assemble the court in the middle of this oval-shaped, bright yellow building. Um, Johnny Scobie was there, there was a, a custody officer there, his counsel was there. At some time, there was reference to a suspended jail sentence. And Joby, Johnny Scobie had English, but not complete English, heard the word jail and ran, literally fled from the Freegon Hall. But he's brought back in and was explained that he wouldn't be going into jail. And then we proceeded with the case. When I started, there was virtually nobody in the hall at all. But within minutes, I was aware of people drifting in till eventually the entire community, black and white, was standing around the walls of this room watching the proceedings. During the course of the proceedings, I asked the elders whether they would like to speak to me or speak about it, and they did. Um, I can't now recall the detail of what was said. There was quite some communication. But I do recall the, uh, one of the elders saying, Judge, we'll see that Johnny behaves well. He will follow White, Whitey's law and Blackfellow's law. And so the community took him back in. He was under a restriction about not drinking alcohol he was receiving anti-libido injections monthly from a visiting nurse. And I was told that the local, the women of the, of, of the, of the peoples would take him out bush and he'd be cured. And that was later reported to be that had happened. I don't know what happened, but uh, anyway, Johnny was then back in the community. About two years later, because uh, I continued to monitor his case, I had a request that he, he wanted to marry and to take him off the anti-libido uh, treatment. And I said, no, I don't think so. I think we'll just maintain that because I wasn't all satisfied that on the medical evidence that he would relapse if uh, th those conditions um, um, were varied. So broadly, that's the story of Johnny Scobie. 
I made inquiries as best I could uh, whether he stayed out of trouble and the reports I had back were that he had. And then I did receive one report there'd been some, some incident but nothing very serious. So the Royal Commission recommendations were followed through in Johnny Scobie's case. It took two years to sentence him. My sentence remarks uh, went to about 70 pages because I recounted the whole history of the matter. The actual remarks themselves are quite short. But in the judgment, I decided I would set out all that had happened and all that had to be done to give Johnny Scobie a fair, fair go. And that was found by the state reports that had been the subject of articles and what have you. Now, it'd be very difficult for any judge to find the amount of time I found to sentence somebody. But in a sense, I was using the case as a vehicle not only to give Johnny Scobie justice as I saw it, but to explore the problems with regard to these Royal Commission recommendations and to see if they could in fact be given effect to, and they were. The result, instead of being locked up for 10, 20, 30 years or whatever, perhaps for his entire life, uh, Johnny Scobie returned to his community. They received and supported him and the obvious benefits from that to the community and to Johnny a pretty clear cut. So as a summary, that's as uh, I'll describe the case. Well, there's, there's so much, Judge, in this case um, that, that sort of stands out. I, I almost don't know where to begin. But the, when I first read it, what did strike me when I tallied up the days, and it's listed at the top how many hearing days, there's 13 he 33, I think, hearing days mm -hmm. over two years. And essentially, and for a matter that could have been sent back to the magistrate's court, um, and so there was a clear decision taken to slow the justice system down. Uh, and from what I hear in the way you describe it, to essentially attempt to hold the various players within that system to what we might understand as their responsibilities under the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. Um, um, is, was, that your, was that your experience of having to slow it down? And I think picking up our theme of taking Indigenous experience into account, um, it, it, it strikes me, and perhaps this might be the provocation, there's a very curious transcript passage from 1989 in which there's a discussion between a judge who's sentencing, I think, Johnny Scobie and counsel where they essentially debate whether they should assess, there should be an assessment. And I might let you take the story there, but that, I think, the comparison between that and then spending 33 days over two years to make the various agencies do what they really should be doing is pretty dramatic. It's in the previous matter, the judge was hearing submissions from counsel, and the judge was concerned that he didn't have a proper medical assessment of Johnny Scobie and his me mental state. And he asked counsel, shouldn't I order a report? And defence counsel's response was, well, um, is it really necessary, Your Honour? What's it going to show? And the prosecutor said, well, look, we're ambivalent about it, Your Honour. If Your Honour wants to order, of course, it will happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so it was left at that sort of level. The judge didn't insist. They agreed that the judge would make a recommendation that he have rehabilitation, treatment, and assessment when in custody. It was a serious offence. He had to go to custody, into custody. Um, now. I was well aware, reading that, that his prospects of getting rehabilitation treatment in custody, or even a medical assessment, were very remote indeed. I mean, there were some rehabilitation programs available, but they were geared to non-Aboriginal people. He would never qualify. Uh, his language difficulties would mean that he would not really be able to engage. So. I looked at that and thought, I don't want that to happen again. And so that motivated me to keep the matter in my list. I felt very, I felt that Johnny Scobie had been badly dealt with by the justice system. I was pretty appalled to read that transcript. 
said that's not the way it should go, uh, particularly when you know, well, I was aware, and I think the judge would have been, the prospects of anything happening in jail are pretty remote. Mm. And even today, it's very difficult in Australian jails to have really good, tailored rehabilitation programs for Indigenous people. And, and so for me, another aspect of this is, is essentially, and it comes out of the judicial monitoring and taking an, action, a, a, an active solution-focused role, if you like, which is not standard and still not standard, except in perhaps some drug and alcohol sentencing courts or, 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 or Nunga courts. But at some point in the judgment, you indicate that on occasions you sat Nunga style. I wonder if you could explain that to our audience. Yes, what does that well, mean? Uh, the, the Nunga style court was then in its infancy, really, in South Australia. It's very much like your circle court or the ACT. Or every state now has its Indigenous courts where, the, where the, the judge will sit very informally and will receive information. Elders will come and speak. You might have the, um, uh, the defendant and the victim in some dialogue. Um, in the Scobie case, um, it would be a question of my receiving information from uh, people, Indigenous people, auntie might be in court or uh, an elder might be there and I would um, informally ask them for their help in the matter and would they tell me uh, why they're in court and tell me about Johnny and what the problem is in their community. And it was through that process that I learned that the community, if he could be treated, would have him back and would look after him. So that was really a question of, from time to time, being prepared to be very informal in the sentencing process, all about my being informed about relevant matters relevant to the Indigenous community, because it, it was fairly obvious to me that if I could reach a situation where the, his community took him back in, then I'd be achieving what the Royal Commission was trying to achieve, and if I was patient about it and took time about it, took the time necessary, I was fairly confident we'd get there. Um, because by this time, I was getting reports back about treatment, about ongoing medical assessment from Dr O'Brien. <coughs> and the matter was developing, in, in my view, in a way that could lead to his release um, into the community, rather than back into jail into that vicious cycle of release, reoffend, back into jail, release, alcohol, reoffend, back into jail. It was ever increasing penalties because of his growing criminal record. But you're quite right, it, it, the whole process did slow down. Uh, one of the principal reasons for that was that I wouldn't accept being told by the Crown that this Royal Commission recommendation about bail or where Scabby might be imprisoned or uh, about the level of treatment that he might receive. I just refused to accept that bland answer. It's not available, Your Honour, and so we'll right, have an argument about it. And I, th I think for me that if, if we sort of step out into um, kind of systemic and structural issues, because there's a lot of lessons here and there's, there's many ways I and many things that this prompts my thinking about. But one of the statements you said is, well, there's no money available for that, was one of the responses. And you said, well, that's not good enough. There's got to be money for that. But I think it, it, it strikes me that there's always money for more prison cells. Okay. Uh, and that we're always, as a society, that's, that's almost like easy and default. And what happened here was, we're not going down that easy track. Um, now, I think you've perhaps spoken about that, but one of the things that I wanted to um, I mean, you chose to record in detail this full story, um, uh, which can be read, and it seems to me that th there was a purpose in that to perhaps provide some encouragement, guidance about the way people can, in whatever their position, even if they're a magistrate in a, is a busier list or, or otherwise, think a little bit differently. What, what was your hope by by really recording all of, of this detail and this sort of slowing down of the process? Well, I had succeeded uh, over time in having the relevant recommendations of the Commission given effect to. Um, 
money was found. And money was found because I don't think the government wanted to have a major exposure of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't want to have a, have a Supreme Court judge ruling on these matters along the way, saying the government would not meet the Royal Commission recommendations in regard to an indigenous uh, Pitjantjara man from the bush. Um, I think that that would, would be an acute embarrassment to them. And so they would always eventually give ground on that issue in this case and avoid um, the matter being argued out. So later I just thought I would write it up, that uh, I thought it was important this be recorded. And I hoped that other judges would um, have regard to it. And I was aware, for example, of the work of um, uh, other judges in prior cases, um, uh, the Fernando case, which set out principles about sentencing. Um, I was aware of the very few cases that ever referred to the Royal Commission recommendations. And uh, in a sense, they were, as I say, they were policy, but not legislated. Very few have been reflected in legislation as distinct from a policy statement. Um, even today you hear about um, recommendations from Royal Commissions and the government said, well, we will, uh, we adopt all those recommendations. That's the policy, to put them into legislation. It's another, another matter. So uh, I think really that was very much my ultimate motive in writing it up. Um, as I said to Anthony before, I did have, in my work I had two associates, two highly qualified young lawyers who work with me. Uh, one of those associates um, was very, very interested in this case and really did a lot of work on it. She later married an Aboriginal man, she was white, uh, worked at Port Augusta, um, working with Aboriginal people, take a swag up to the lands on the uh, bush courts in the lands. Um, so she was, I think probably she might have pushed me pretty hard to, mm -hmm. uh, to keep at it, and I was pretty determined. So it was good to have somebody in my chambers who was young and enthusiastic about the case as well. So uh, I, it's, it's, um, it is an inspirational story, and I'll, I'll shortly hand over to the audience because I, I, and see what questions we get. And uh, uh, I think judge has told me he's open to anything you're prepared to throw at him. And I think we should take that literally and see what happens. So um, um, be brave in that. I'm also happy to throw in to the extent that it's useful with my own experience. But I have to sort of say there is something that troubles me, uh, and not about the decision, but it's about the systemic and structural issues. And I think my experience suggests there are a lot of Johnny Scobies, and I'm not just talking, you know, this particular facts and, and pedophilia and so on, but the sort of instances of you know, unexplored fetal alcohol spectrum you know, disorder, um, uh, you know, addiction issues that are never really treated that have come out of trauma, and the trauma that ultimately, if we fully investigate, it comes back to colonisation. Um, um, and, and all of these sort of aspects, there are a lot of Johnny Scobies, and we can't ultimately rely on having someone who will say, I'm going to, I'm going to make this, this justice system do its job. Or, or maybe what we actually need is, is more and more people who are doing that wherever they have some capacity to have an influence in whatever role. Um, uh, but I was recently with students, uh, took students um, to Alice Springs and we went and watched a, a, a sentence. I think I, I told you this example. We, we took students in, uh, we had some um, indigenous uh, justice leaders working with, with us who were leading the whole course and bringing their perspectives and they wanted students to go in and see and then to come out and sit down and talk about is that justice. And what we saw within a space of about, mm, let's say five minutes, was someone appearing on AVL who likely didn't speak English as a first language, perhaps third, fourth, fifth language, um, who uh, was facing a significant serious charge. Um, a lawyer doing their very best with a limited time but uh, client on AVL, no interpreter to be seen, uh, and um, a, a number of years jail handed out at the end of a short period. So the contrast for me is striking and troubling, and I suppose 
troubling also on the front that if we look at those statistics as they stand, um, it feels like, um, you know, without, without wanting to put a dampener on, on, the, on the possibilities, because I think the possibilities are huge, there needs to be structural as well as individual, and, and it'll, structural changes are going to come through individuals. Um, but they need to go to that level. Uh, so there's not really a question in that. It's unless you want to, unless you want to say anything in relation to that. But I'm actually inclined to, to throw open now because we have about 25 minutes. So if there's anything you wish to say on that, otherwise, you let that let that let that pass. All right. So um, perhaps we'll just just open up to to any questions from anyone in the audience, and um, you know, I really invite you to take it what you might think is left field. It doesn't have to relate, no, no expectation that you've read SCOBY or you want to really explore that, but yes. Just one word, I'm a little deaf, so please speak up. I can do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the numbers that you spoke about, the, the star, I think it's worth noting that those numbers are increasing per capita, as well as the number of people that identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander are also increasing. So they're increasing and that's increasing and that's fine, quite helpful. Um, Judge, my question for you, if I could take you back to the number court and the, um, the aunties at that court, or I think it was one auntie or a couple of aunties, mm. when they said, when they left the door open for scope, they said, we'll have him back, but you need to fix him first. Yeah. Do you think they were saying, this is your problem, you broke him, you fix him? And if you do, how do we enable that so that do that more across all my, my view was a little different. I took them as saying we would like to work with the court to help Johnny Scobie. And I've later dealt with Nunga style hearings and I've always been left with the impression that the elders, the aunties, etc., want to work with me in getting the right result. They're not looking for a soft sentence. They don't want a soft option. They want their... Um, they want to get a person out of the criminal justice system. And that's what they want Johnny Scobie. They wanted him out, but they, they were well aware that without uh, proper treatment, without support, he would fail. I mean, they've seen that time and again. So they were... Rather than saying it's your problem, you fix it. They weren't saying that to me as I understood it. Um, perhaps, uh, um, perhaps I'm wrong, but I was saying we would like to work with you. Uh, we as a community will take him back, but only after he's received treatment. And by this time, we were talking about um, uh, treatment in regard to uh, avoiding alcohol, uh, the, the use of um, anti-libido injections, um, uh, fairly regular medical review. But to achieve all that in the lands, uh, a thousand kilometres north of Adelaide, is not, um, not easy. So I was having to insist that the government would provide the resources to have that happen. So for example, to be... Um, assessed by the psychiatrist, he really needed to travel to the la uh, from the lands to Port Augusta for that assessment. He needed accommodation in Port Augusta. So that had to be found. Sometimes it could be found with the family, uh, other times it couldn't be. So he had some time on the lands, in the community, receiving treatment uh, with the scheme, with the rehabilitation scheme in place before I finally sentenced him. I can't remember the exact sequence now, but um, I had the, I felt I had the support of the Aboriginal peoples in the community to work with me. And I think without that, it would have been very difficult uh, for Johnny Scobie, because where would he be gone? I mean, yes, he could live in the community at Port Augusta, but then uh, all the problems with alcohol there that perhaps could be better controlled on the lands at that time. And at that time, these were essentially dry areas, apart from the people who ran alcohol in through and drugs in from the uh, uh, opal mining areas. Mm. Uh, I, I, 
just going to add one thing and throw it to another question, but I think it can, this is just my reading of Judge's decision. I think you can read the interaction between the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody and what's happening and holding the state to account in various ways by reference to that. A broad reading of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody would, would sheet responsibility home to colonisation and to the colony, if you like, ongoing, however we want to talk about it. And I think that um, that that what that means is there is a shouldering of, well, it seems to me you could read the decision as shouldering a responsibility as a judge within that broader context uh, and how that then gets met by those that come in might be much more just relational and so forth. But there's certainly that tone, I would say, coming through. Uh, I don't know if that... If, if I could add, um, I mean, the various members of the government departments involved I mean, they, they, they weren't um, anti what was happening. It's just that they had their limits on funding and they had their protocols. Uh, but I felt over time that um, uh, I was able to develop a cross-government um, acceptance of the need for support. And I was relying on Crown Council, of course, but I, again, I was saying, I want these government depart departments to work with the court in effecting a result. So um, it, was a, it was a most unusual sentence, sentencing process. I might say that um, it's not often a judge gets a chance to do what I did. And um, I don't regret for a moment uh, taking the time um, for Johnny Scope because I, I saw it as having the potential to help many, many cases, not just Johnny Scobie's. And I think that speaks to the theme that, in you know, some ways is developing in my mind, which is that wherever you are within the justice system, there's a capacity to do something differently. But in this case, you had to perhaps force it or even empower because they get to say, well, this, the judges said that's not good enough. We need to get the resources. And so they get them. Um, and so that's, that, that, in a sense, then means through those connections and webs, people are doing things differently. They're learning to do things a little differently. So I think that's, that's a, a story. It doesn't take being the judge, perhaps, to do something differently within the system, wherever you might have an influence. Yes, well, the, the SCOBY case was then referred to in Parliament in South Australia. Um, so there was a political awareness about it. Now, all that can dissipate in time, of course. But it's there, and there will be another case that will build on that and build on that. And through that, I believe there'll be change. I mean, I know it's very slow. And I know, as you say, the incarcerate, incarcerate, incarceration rates continue to rise. Um, but uh, so somewhere there has to be a reckoning in all this. At some point, um, uh, our parliamentarians have to say, no, we must address this. And it's not just a question of throwing money at the issue. It's a question of something more than that. Um, I think one of my great disappointments with royal commissions is that uh, uh, you have a huge royal commission like this one involving across Australia, a number of uh, assistant commissioners written up uh, enormous length with Indigenous involvement through Pat Dodson um, a remarkable man, Elliot Johnson, uh, dealing with Pat Dodson. Uh, huge empathy on the part of Johnson to Indigenous people. Who now reads the whole report? And uh, I think, again, <laughs> so many things I need to... Um, but it takes us to that point of why, why a voice, for example, is so important that holds to account at the highest level so we get structural change in relation to these sorts of matters. But you know, perhaps that's it's not to the side, but um, let me throw open to any other question. Yes. Hi, Greg. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Scobie's request um, to get off the anti-Lido treatment um, when mm. he was getting married. I wanted to ask whether, when you were making that decision about whether to discontinue his treatment or not, um, whether there was scope for you to discuss with the elders of the community about that or whether it was sort of a decision based more on the medical reports that you were receiving about it? Yes. It wasn't a case of my being able to sit down and discuss that with the community, but I was told very clearly that the community were supporting that. Um, but they didn't have the information that I had that these uh, anti-libido injections were 
um, working. That was the medical assessment I had. And it's a case where I couldn't agree um, to his being relieved of that obligation because of the risk that there was to uh, children in their community. Um, the case received a very short case note in the Australian Law Journal by um, the editor Peter Young, who's a very fine traditional judge <laughs> in regard to commercial equity matters out of New South Wales. And he obviously was a bit taken aback about the time I'd spent in this sentence remarks and was uh, recognised the importance of it. But his last line was, ultimately, the paramount interest here must be the safety of children. And he's right. I mean, this was an indigenous community with quite a few children, and I wasn't prepared to run the risk of any um, paedophilic abuse to those children. So I, 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 in a sense, I had a very clear statement from the uh, women in the community that they wanted this to happen, and I said no. And while, while we're on that, there's a clear statement in this and in, I think, other writing and speeches that, that you've, you've given, that if, if protection of the community is the key focus, then you have to ask the question, why not assessments as soon as an issue arises? And why aren't we getting to the bottom of something to provide the protection that ultimately was available? Because jail was only ever, in this case, a kind of, you're in now, or now you're out, or it's happened again, you know, you're in, you're in, and it's, you know, ultimately, you have to ask the question, is that protecting the community? And the answer has to be no. That, that's a very good point, because in the criminal law, if there's an issue about danger to children, it's very difficult for a sentencing judge not to really make that the, uh, a very important consideration. I, I might say that um, I felt unease about the matter. Um, I mean, the idea of Johnny Scobie marrying and being a regular member of the community was, I thought, a very attractive uh, prospect. But on the medical evidence I had, I wasn't prepared to go down that line. But the point that Anthony has just made, had this assessment been made right at the start, what a difference. He wouldn't have spent 10 years in custody. He wouldn't have come out without any support. He wouldn't have come out without any treatment or rehabilitation. And uh, it would have been a very different life for him. I feel confident that had these matters been addressed properly at the start, uh, it would have been a very different story. But that was history. I couldn't do a thing about that. Yes, Anna. I have so many questions and comments, but I'll confine myself to one, which is a practical one. Do you think now, almost 20 years later, given there's increased knowledge and understanding, and we've had the High Court's decision, bug me or I can have several questions on your thoughts on bug me. Um, on the other hand, increased court pressures, expectations to deal with matters faster, um, increased complexity with forensic reports, etc. Do you think that you could do this now? I would take 33 do, days. I would do it now because as a Supreme Court judge, nobody can tell you not to. <laughs> I mean, as a Supreme Court judge, I had the same power as the Chief Justice. He couldn't direct me. Um, so I would do the same thing again. And I'm rather hopeful there be members of the judiciary who would. I mean, I was the first and only Supreme Court judge to ever sentence somebody on the lands. And no district court judge in South Australia is sentenced on the lands. Now, that to me is a very uh, strange... Uh, situation. So the short answer to your question is I'd do it again without hesitation because nobody could stop me. <laughs> I might just say, uh, if I could digress for a moment, about interpreters. Now, Johnny Scobie had a level of understanding of English. It was not, I mean, he wasn't fluent. I could, I thought that if I talked directly to him as I did on occasions, that the message got through. But I, he, I did have an experienced uh, uh, legal rights movement solicitor there who was assuring me that this, what I was saying was being understood. So I felt comfortable about that. 
But there are other cases where it's plain that the uh, Aboriginal defendant, Indigenous defendant, just does not understand. I dealt with two homicide, I'll give you an illustration, I dealt with two homicide cases. Uh, both were pleas of guilty of manslaughter and I sentenced the two men in Port Augusta. I couldn't go to the lands where the crimes took place to send it to the community because there's a, a, a lack of security there. I uh, couldn't do it. The relevant community um, could go to Maori and watch on video the process. And I sentenced these men going through conventional sentencing remarks, which, uh, as you'd be aware in a serious matter, uh, um, you've got to cover a number of matters to ensure that the, any appeal court who hears it knows you've addressed everything properly. And I thought, well, this language is not going to really filter through in the community. So I made arrangements for my sentencing remarks to be translated into Pichinjara. I had to force the government to find the money, and it took some time. Eventually, I went to the lands to arrange for the radio station to uh, have this broadcast. But before I did so, I spoke to the elders, and they said, no, 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 it's too late now. It's all history. We don't want to go back over it. So I left the written translation with the various communities. But the person in the translation did a back translation for me. So I had the uh, Jarrah translation turned back into English. And my word, there was a difference between what I said in court <laughs> and the back translation. Uh, there were, it was much more direct. It was simpler and more direct and rid of the legalese. So um, I think I've never heard of that being done any other time. <laughs> but it, it brought home to me, A, the need for immediacy in the communication to the community, and it emphasised the need for a translation. Judge, do you have a copy of those back translated and the Pitinjara version? And it just strikes me that that's the sort of thing that would be a remarkable, it's not been done in my experience ever. So. Um, I, I, yes, I, I have kept it somewhere. I have to dig out through uh, old papers, but I'll, I'll do that. And if I can find it, I'll send it through. But, I mean, it, it is, it, it just explained to me so clearly how difficult it is for Indigenous people hearing the sort of stylized uh, uh, sentencing remarks, which judges are trained to do to deal with matters. Now, in a magistrate's court, Nunga Circuit Sur Court, the language is much more direct, and, but in more serious matters, it doesn't come out that way. I mean, you can't just send somebody to 10 years jail without giving uh, what are well-recognised sentencing remarks, uh, covering all the issues in a way that an appeal court can then review it. That's your obligation. In a way that, without translation, the Indigenous defendant is not going to understand, let alone the community. So I'm going to ask for another question, but I can't help but pick up on the, the question about bug me. And, yes. and, and so I'm going, I'm going down a track. One of the points that council was arguing in the case of Bugme, and students may be familiar, but it's one of the most cited cases, I think, now in the AC Magistrates Court, but probably across the country in relation to how do you take disadvantage into account. Um, but, but going back to the High Court decision, there was an argument being put in the High Court that Australia should adopt a Canadian position, which was a position that required um, judges in sentencing cases, and in fact, far beyond sentencing now into bail and all other circumstances, I think including into child protection, an obligation to pay particular attention to Aboriginal background and circumstance. Almost like, and it, it, from the Canadian Supreme Court, the point was um, there has been a failure to pay attention, so a failure to actually understand about Indigenous experience in this way. So therefore, the only way to correct it is a positive obligation and it's not discriminatory in any way, it's actually the correction of a failure. Now, I know we've taken us a little bit off, but the way I want to line this back up is that in SCOBY, we can read this, uh, along with other, the, uh, other cases you've been involved in, as an attempt to pay particular attention uh, and a recognition from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Less and Custody, it's failed. Actually, my question was going to be a bit of a variation on the thing. The High Court said, well, we can't 
do that, we don't have Section 18-2E. Mm. Yes. Like I was going to say, could the High Court have said, well, we do have the Rickardick Report. <laughs> it is one they prepared early. And I was going to say, what do you think? You know, that, that was a bit of a missed opportunity, right? I followed Bugley pretty closely. At, and, and, and read the judgments very closely and was, I might say, very disappointed. Um, I can see that the judges were motivated to say that we've got one criminal justice system and that in particular cases the Indigenous background is important context. But you just can't simply say it's always important and as, and as the Canadians said, it is a mitigating factor. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is that it is relevant, it is part of the context, whether it's a, sub, a suburban indigenous person or somebody from the lands or whatever, there's a context there, there's a history there, there's, uh, as Anthony would say, there's a whole of the problems from colonisation and that gets swept aside if you simply say we're going to treat all Australians the same way and yes, if you can show there's some particular reason why this background is important to have regard to, but you must establish that. It seems to me to be fairly obvious that it's there in every case to some degree. And you're quite right, uh, in the cases I had that involved Indigenous people, I tried to have proper regard to what I viewed as their very disadvantaged circumstances in coming to a European-style court so foreign to their way of... Um, uh, their own systems of justice. Um, I mean, there was, in many ways, their system of justice um, it was swift, uh, it had a tough edge to it, but it seemed to work. They seemed to control their society. But I'm not sure I know as much as Anthony would about it, but I do think that um, the High Court were more concerned with... Um, giving that recognition when they should have. I mean, I, I, I can see no reason why they shouldn't have said, look, this is the case for Indigenous venting, it's a factor. And I think probably most judges and magistrates do have regard to it uh, to some degree, perhaps not. I mean, for example, in talking about the cases, well, the homicide cases, well, the sentences imposed on Aboriginal men for homicide would be a half to two thirds of that could be imposed for a similar crime by uh, a white offender. In South Australia? In South Australia. Uh, I, I've never seen the analysis but um, in detail, but I'm aware that when I was sentencing, I was ratcheting it down quite a bit because of an awareness of these deeper issues. All right, thank you. Um, I think I saw, I don't know who was first. Uh, I was going to ask in terms of um I know Professor, you brought up the whole Indigenous Voice. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Um, Professor, you brought up the Indigenous Voice of Parliament before. I was wondering, um, and we kind of touched on the kind of difference between law and justice that do exist in all of these cases where the laws of law and justice is out, often outside the law. I was wondering, um, do you see the Indigenous Voice of Parliament being able to kind of bring these concepts of law and justice together and provide kind of better outcomes in, in the justice system? Um, yeah, I think I'm not sure that I fully understand the question, but um, if the law doesn't produce a just result, there's a major problem. It means that the law and justice are not intersecting the way they should. Um, so the obligation of a sentencing judge is to, in that very trite phrase, the punishment's got to fit the crime. But the crime is in a context. And so what's just in one case is not in another case. But I'm not sure that I'm really answering your question. Perhaps I, I could just throw some, some thoughts into it. I mean, I, I think we are looking at individual efforts within a system that ultimately, if you look at the the statistics and that can just give you a straight deficit narrative anyway and we're really straying into that so we have to be you know careful rather than strength based approaches but i think if we look at that we would say the system it's not working it's broken it's going the wrong direction so that's why i think the uluru statement itself calls for structural change and i think that's why the voice actually has the potential 
to impact structural change. How does that look just in a criminal justice system context? It would look at saying, well, at every instance of this criminal justice process, we need to reconsider what's going on. Uh, and that would include the child protection process, which is such a, uh, a, a conveyor belt into the criminal justice process. So, so I think what it does is it allows a potential holding to account on a, on a really grand scale. And not just that, importantly, it's not, and I think there's a real role for non-Indigenous people holding to account and playing their role wherever they can within a system. I think absolutely they have to be allies. It just can't happen without that. But ultimately it's going to be voices of First Nations people who are going to provide that leadership and solutions and then it's the allies that will come in in that. So that's a bigger conversation, but it's nice that we can kind of probably almost end on that idea that through small... Uh, well, not small. I think SCOBY is a very significant piece of work and I feel in some sense it's a great privilege to be in the room with, with, um, with Judge uh, and to some extent trying to do my bit um, to follow footsteps here. I didn't quite realise until I read it all that I'm trying to follow those footsteps, but I am now. Um, but, but I think we have to step back out to a bigger narrative and we also have to come back to First Nations voices as well. Um, so I don't know if that, that's an answer or more like a little Can statement for you. If there is a major change taking place, it's through the circle and Nunga courts that are now well established, certainly informally throughout Australia. And in South Australia, the attorneys just announced they're going to formalise Nunga court with a leg spear, clear legislative backing rather than simply a a practice that's developed. Um, that to me is very significant because the Circle Court, the Nunca Court, do bring the um, uh, First Peoples into court. It does give them a clear voice in the process. And if it's conducted properly by the judges, magistrates, then it really does provide a major change in the way Indigenous offenders are, are sentenced. And uh, I, I think that if if there is a change, I mean, that's quite a significant change in the way sentencing's approached and has come about essentially in the last two decades. And if the states legislate and give it backing, provide Aboriginal liaison officers who are experienced in conducting those hearings, that the judiciary are properly trained about how to use that material, you do have a major change that can bring about a much juster solution. And I think um, given the time, um, we probably do need to end, but there may be some ca capacity after this for Judge and I to remain and have any kind of individual conversations, but we'll end the recording. Um, I would just also say that increasingly there are First Nations people as lawyers, as judges, in, I mean, we see it very clearly in Parliament. Uh, so there's the capacity to work and to have that infused within the justice system. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to end on that optimistic note from you, um, Judge. And I would just um, like to again thank uh, Associate Professor Heather Roberts for bringing Judge to us and creating these conversations uh, and, um, and for this, the Judicial Visitors Program. And to all of you for coming along to engage. Uh, and um, for whatever drew you here, um, I hope it's been something that has been useful for you. And if we could just give Judge a bit of a round of applause.